there we go, the baking pan that we are going to be using today to bake the dish. So I've already gone ahead and lined it. I've used oil to spray all around and my, my pan actually curves in the corners as you can see. And what I've done is to avoid um, putting baking paper around the corners. The reason for that is because if I do put baking paper in there, when I pour the custard in later on, it's gonna try and climb behind the crevices and it's gonna bake and it's not gonna look very pretty. And so for that reason, I've kept very square um, uh, bake, baking paper and I've actually just made sure I've kept it to the straight parts of the baking pan. So if you've got a perfectly square baking pan, you're good. You don't have to worry about that. Just kind of line it all the way through. But if you've got a curved one, that's how I've done it. And this is an eight inch um, uh, bake, square baking pan, just in terms of the size. So I'm gonna put that to the side for now. We're gonna come back to him later. Um, to get started, we're gonna be doing our um, rice dish. Um, so the base of the cake is actually a glutinous rice. So to do that, we're going to need a pot of um, water, which is this guy. And um, in here, I've got some water already. But what I'm going to quickly show you before we start the pan going with the um, fire is a little trick we do with Malaysian desserts. So when we hack, then there's a lot of Malaysian desserts that are steamed. And what we actually do is we take the lid, as you can see, it's got a lot of condensation on it already. What that can do is interfere with the appearance of the top of the dish. And so to avoid that, we actually tie a towel over the lid. So I'm just gonna do that real quick. Um, and that's gonna make sure that any steam that comes up to the top of the pan doesn't actually <laughs> collect and drop back into the dish. So hopefully that's able to go through. And then I'll do it for the other side as well. There we go. And for this side. Nope, not cooperating with me today. Here we go, one more time. So that's ready to go. So it's covered all around, as you can see. Um, so long as it's as big or as wide as the diameter of the lid, you're good to go. I'm going to get the pot going and then I'm going to just quick, quickly switch cameras um, to show you what the pot's going to look like. So let me just quickly do that. You'll see the pot and the lid. Um, I've got a steamer basket that opens up like a flower to be able to sit just above the water that's in there already. You don't have to use a steamer basket if you don't have one. And sometimes steamer baskets come with a little sort of a stick that prevents you from putting stuff on it. It's meant to be for veggies around it. So you can always use a bowl and you can just flip the bowl upside down um, inside the pot to use it as a stand. Or you can use the aluminum foil balls to just kind of elevate whatever you want to have resting. Um, I am going to go ahead and use the steamer basket because I have it handy. Um, I'm also going to be using this uh, eight inch cake pan. Um, and, and the trick with this, two things to call out, you want to make sure that the pan can sit inside and have enough space around the pan for uh, steam to come up, because um, otherwise it's going to interfere with the cooking process. And similarly, you don't want your pan too high up that when you put the lid on top, it's going gonna, it's gonna to sit on top of the pan, because that's going to prevent the steam from coming in to cook the rice. So that's the setup and it's ready to go. Um, so we're going to let that water come to a boil and while we do that we are going to get our rice ready. So to get started with that I have my pan and I've got coconut oil um, and I'm just going to spray it generously because what we're going to do is we're going to cook glutinous rice in this pan and it's going to get extremely sticky. So even though this is a non-stick pan we're going to need some some oil to go on it and it's and the oil is just for greasing it's not to cook anything um, and I'm using coconut oil because we're going to use coconut milk with the, the glutinous rice and it's just going to add to the flavor. So here I go with my coconut oil. And I wasn't kidding about being generous. I am going to spray it <laughs> to death. <laughs> That's a great tip about the towel over the lid of the pan. I've never thought to do that before. Yeah, it's um, a lot of people, I think it's a very Asian thing. Um, uh, traditionally in terms of how cooking is done there. But yeah, I'm sure there are other ways within which folks can certainly um, use that as a tip. Um, so that's ready to go. That's my little oil pan. I'm just gonna put them to the side for a second so that I can get my rice going. So 
for that, we're going to need rice. <laughs> so this is glutinous rice that's been soaking uh, overnight. Um, as you can see, the water is not entirely clear. I probably washed this rice about four to five times, probably five times. Um, and I've just let that drain down. I just wanted to keep that water to show you it's not going to be translucent. There's still going to be some cloudiness, and that's okay. As long as we wash most of the starch away, that's what we're aiming for, because the rice is already going to be quite sticky, plus the coconut milk. So we want to take out as much starch as we can before we soak it. It's soaked overnight for me, but you can actually just soak it for a minimum of four hours. Um, you don't want to actually be soaking it with the lid shut. Um, you want to let it uh, let the sort of air just be able to come in and out of the bowl. And the reason for that is if we actually let the, um, uh, the rice sit in the water covered, it's going to start to ferment. And when it ferments, it's going to turn sour and that's going to interfere with the taste of the dish. So we don't want that. Um, I'm just going to let the rice sit in the sink to finish, um, to finish draining altogether. And I'm going to get started with my other ingredients. So we're going to be using a couple of things today to make the rice. We're going to have uh, coconut milk, uh, coconut water, um, and some salt. So for that, I'm just going to quickly show you guys. These are Australian ingredients, but um, uh, Australian brands rather, but I don't know what they have in, in the US. Um, but just so that you have, I'm just going to put my coffee to the side, just so you guys have um, a bit of um, familiarity of the products. So this is regular coconut milk. It's a Thai labeled one. Um, it's basically freshly grated coconut sitting in a, a bottle. Um, what's going to happen with this one is it's because it's winter here, it's quite cold. Um, it's it's going to have little lumps in there. And so what I've already done is gone ahead and got myself a protein shaker. And I just basically pour the coconut milk in there with the springy ball and I just shake them up. See, it's already quite stiff. <laughs> So that's going to get it going like a, like a hand blender, I guess, without needing a blender. Um, so that's going to be what I use. You're more than welcome to get regular coconut milk. You don't want coconut cream um, because that's going to be too thick. Uh, you do want coconut milk. And if you do use coconut uh, milk that's light, that's going to be more diluted than regular coconut milk. So I'll call out some of the variations around measurements. But those are the options that you have for coconut milk. Um, and so I've just got my weighing scale here because I like weighing everything. Um, that way it's um, more accurate. And I'm going to need 150 mils of uh, coconut milk. Um, and then I'm going to use 100 mils of water on top of that. So I'm going to have a total 250 mils of liquid. So this is going to be 150 mils. So as I mentioned, if you are going to use coconut, light, uh, coconut milk that's light-ish, what I would say is you probably want to make it more 200 mils of the light coconut milk and just 50 mils of, of water. That way you don't dilute the milk too much. Um, and the reason we're actually even putting water in this is so that it is able to absorb into the rice. Otherwise, milk that's this thick is too viscous. It's not going to get into the rice very easily. So that's my milk. I'm just going to add a little bit of water. So for me, it'll be 100 mils. There we go. And I'm just going to add a teaspoon of salt to that. And then we're going to be ready to go. So I'm just using table salt so that it dissolves relatively quickly instead of anything like koshering salt, because that's going to be too thick, uh, too big, the granules specifically. And I've just got my little spatula to stir. And that's ready to go. I'm going to move these guys to the side. And I'm going to pull my pan back in front of me. And the rice is relatively drained now. So I'm just going to put that on like so. There we go. That's most of it. And there we have it. So that's the rice that's in here and all that coconut oil at the bottom. And this is just going to go all over the top. And that, yep, I need to make sure I get all that salt out. Doesn't always dissolve. And just a little bit of a stir. Um, not so much to mix the coconut milk in there, but more so to 
just make sure that the rice is nice and truly covered inside um, or sort of submerged in the milk if you like. And that's ready to go. The only thing we're gonna need for this little guy is pandan leaf. So for those of you who have never seen a pandan leaf or um, are struggling to buy some, I know someone said that before. Um, for the purposes of the rice, we wanna make sure we're steaming uh, with a pandan leaf. So if you don't have fresh pandan leaves, you could try frozen pandan leaves or dried pandan leaves. Those are fine. I just put some boiling water um, and let, let it sit in boiling water for a little bit. And that's really just gonna wake up the, the oils and you can just scatter some on top. It doesn't need to be put inside the rice because it's not gonna help um, enhance the flavor any more than if it were just sitting on top of the rice. And it's also gonna help you later on because this rice is gonna get really sticky and you don't wanna be pulling rice off of the pandan leaf. So those are your options for this particular part of the dish. This is a pandan leaf, just so you know. So that's kind of one leaf. I've got actually two here. Um, there's always a flat part that's sort of to at the end of the leaf and sort of a, a tapered part that's where it starts growing from. Um, I'm going to tie this leaf up and maybe um, some of you have seen tied or knotted pandan leaves. It's not very difficult to do. So all you need to do is take the side of the leaf that's tapered and fold it and follow the crevice and just kind of fold it all the way in half like that. And I have, I'm right-handed. That's my dominant hand. I'm going to tie with this hand. All I'm gonna do here is hold this guy with my left hand and I'm gonna just do a knot around a couple of fingers like that. And this malleable side of the leaves just gonna go through this hole that I've created a loop with. Hopefully you can see this. And it's just gonna go in whoop, and come out the other side. And there we go. It's tied up in a knot It can sit on the rice. And just all that crumpling is gonna wake up the oils that's coming through um, already. I can feel it in my nose. <laughs> um, in the same way you would, you know, slap um, mint and rosemary to, to wake up the oils in any herb. And so I'm just gonna tuck that one in there just to make sure it's not falling off the dish, but that's it. It's ready to go. That's the rice and the pandan leaf and the pot is boiling hot. So we are going to switch cameras to that one. Yes. And I've just got my steamer thongs that I'm gonna use um, to pick this guy up and put him in. And we're gonna let that steam for about 20 minutes. So I'm gonna keep myself honest with a timer on the oven. So that's set for 20 minutes. The only other thing we need to do with this dish in 20 minutes time is we're gonna have to take him out, um, fluff him around with a pair of chopsticks and add another 100 mils of water. Now, um, and this is where it gets interesting. Um, you can either use plain water or you can use butterfly or blue pea extract. Um, so that's butterfly or blue pea. So hopefully you can see that. So it's, it's actually just, um, it looks like a morning glory flower, but it's native to Southeast, Southeast Asia and it actually turns a very, very bright blue when you steep it. So th that's the color of the tea. It's um, uh, a blue, obviously, by, by virtue of its name. Um, it's got a really, it's like green tea, but it's very earthy and woody. And what that does when we throw it into the rice is it just kind of cuts through the creaminess of the coconut and gives it a little bit more uh, flavor uh, rather than just being coconut uh, milk. Um, you don't have to, you can absolutely just add 100 mils of water. Um, but yeah, I, I, this is actually um, a Nyonya twist. So Nyonya Pranakan is a community of people in Malaysia that started up around the time the Chinese were migrating. Hang on, rather than having me um, talk to my hands, you can talk to my face. So Pranakan community is, um, it came about in the 1400s when the Chinese were trading spices and came through to Malaysia. They sort of settled in Malacca, Penang, Singapore, basically across the Straits of Malacca. And they just sort of started uh, to get to know the locals and they started to intermingle. So they have their own belief system, their own architecture, their own clothes and their own food. One of the things they did was they took what was original, originally Kuisala, that's the name for um, Kuisarimuka. And they actually added this and sort of it sort of is a marbling blue that you do to the rice, and I'll show you that later on. So that makes it a bit of a nyonya twist in terms of it being a traditional way of doing it, but you can just put water, as I said, at the start. 
and you'd be fine. So we'll come back to that and I'll show you how we will model with that in a little bit. But for now, we're gonna switch, switch it up and do the custard. Um, I'm gonna pause Brianna and just see if there are any questions while I get the ingredients out to do the next part of the dish. Um, cameras again to this little, back on, there we go. So we're gonna need to use a blender for this because I'm lazy, <laughs> um, mainly, and because we've got technology working for us. But traditionally you take uh, four eggs, about 210 grams worth of eggs, and you would whisk it with sugar. And you'd whisk it the way you would for some cakes where you want the sugar and the, the eggs to cream. Um, but we're gonna get the blender to do that first. It's just gonna rotate and then the blade's gonna do that hard work for us. So we're gonna use palm sugar. So that's palm sugar. So it's palm sugar that's granulated. Um, it's, um, I'm gonna pour it out in a second, but it's, it's just like regular sugar, except that it smells pretty fragrant. Uh, traditional recipes don't call for palm sugar or coconut sugar is another name for it um, because it actually makes the, the uh, custard quite dark, but I'd rather have the flavor of the coconut and, and, and take the, the dark color that it brings and then offset that with some green dye, which I'll show you later on, because it really does, it just smells amazing. <laughs> so I'm gonna weigh that out. Um, into, so I'm just gonna throw the eggs in first into the jug. And that was four eggs. And we're just gonna weigh this guy out. We just need 150 grams of the sugar. And I will say that I have made this with regular sugar and then I, just for fun, decided to try it with palm sugar and haven't gone back since. So um, it is really quite special when you add um, palm sugar to it. So that's just gonna go straight into the jug and we're just gonna give it a whiz and come back and add our coconut milk. So not long, just about 15 seconds should do it, but it's gonna get noisy in here, so bear with me. All right, so now we've got our coconut milk, the same one I used before. This time we need 200 mils of it. and equal amounts um, water. So again, if you were using coconut light milk, I would do, you know, either if you wanna do 250 mils of coconut light milk and then just 150 mils of water instead, um, that, that would be better so that it's not too liquidy. Um, so that's the milk. I'm just gonna throw some water in there and some salt as well. See, that brings me up to 400 mils. Nope, I need a little bit more. That should do it. Yep, perfect. And this time, some salt again, but not as much as before. So this time, it's just a quarter teaspoon of salt. By the way, all these instructions are in the PDF that Brianna sent out this morning, so you don't have to write, write it all down, um, but it should all be in there. So I'm just gonna swish that around a little bit, and then I'm gonna throw it into the blender and give it another whiz, and then we'll come back at the end and add the flour and a special twist of mine that I'll share in a second as well. Just gonna get that salt in. and do another 15 second whiz. Okay, so we've got him ready to go. As you can see, he's quite liquid. Now we're gonna add two types of flours and these, in addition to the egg that's already in there, these are gonna be our thickening agents. So one part is gonna be plain flour. I just wanna call out, it needs to be plain flour. It can be gluten flour, but we do not want self-raising flour. So this dish doesn't need a raising agent. It just needs regular flour to thicken the custard. Um, so we've got a little bowl ready to go um, to weigh that out. So 90 grams of plain flour. Just gonna spoon that in. And the other flour that we'll be using, I've got tapioca starch today. So tapioca starch is another one of those that you can probably find in an Asian grocer, um, but it, it, you know, it can be a lot of work to, to go and get tapioca starch, especially for this dish. If you'd rather not do that, you're more than welcome to use corn starch or potato starch. 
which you can probably find in a regular grocery store. So I'm using 45 grams of uh, tapioca starch, just going on top of the flour. Now, um, if you wanted to use corn flour, uh, corn starch or potato starch or rice flour, uh, you can definitely use those. You just need to halve the quantity. So instead of 45 grams of tapioca, you just do uh, half of it, so 23 grams, because th those starches are quite starchy relative to tapioca. So you just half the amount. And that should be it. Yep. And we're good to go. So that's just going to go into the blender jug. And again, typically, traditionally, what you'd have to do with this part of the dish is you would um, get a sieve out and you put the flour through the sieve and then you whisk it into the batter. Again, here the, the blade rotates and not only does it clear through any lumps, it just gets it incorporated into the batter. So it's my little cheat sheet way of doing it, like I said, with technology on our side. And one of the reasons I put the tapioca starch on top of the flour is because flour comes off a bowl a lot easier than any kind of starch uh, flour does. So that's just going to slide right into the blender for us. And so that's ready to go. Now, I did mention a little secret ingredient. So I'm just going to switch cameras so you can see me chat about it to add um, star anise. Now, there, there are many variations to this. There are others that add cinnamon and clove and whatnot. But I think star anise works really well with the coconut and the pandan. Um, it is sort of, so pandan is kind of like the, the vanilla of, of Asia, I suppose. That's what it's generally referred to. It doesn't taste like vanilla, but it's like vanilla in, in terms of its characteristics. It's very sort of mellow and kind of just really gentle and just in the background. And so star anise kind of brings that zing. Um, and it kind of, I mean, I, I'm not a licorice fan and, and star anise isn't licorice either, but it has the licorice notes. Uh, and, and so I was a little apprehensive when I first decided to experiment with this, but I was not disappointed. I put two star anise um, whole spices in, so that's a total of two, hopefully you can see that, um, into the blender. And what happens once we blend it in is we're actually going to sieve it out. So we're not, so if you're using powder, I would halve the amount. So I just use anywhere between half to one teaspoon of star anise powder. Um, because we're actually just going to let that sit and, and mix with the uh, batter before we strain it all out. So it's just going to leave that sort of lovely note of star anise. You can completely omit it if you don't want to take my word for it and, and, and trust that it's really good. Um, but you're more than welcome to do it either way. I just highly recommend it. So that's going to whiz up again, this time for about 30 seconds, and then the batter is ready to go and we're going to strain it out for the bain-marie but we're gonna segue back to the rice to make sure that's all ready to go before we start the bain-marie. So I'm just gonna whiz that up one last time. That's done. That's still pretty liquidy as you can see and very brown because we haven't added pandan to it. So we've got, we've got a little bit of time. I might actually just spend a couple of minutes talking through pandan because that was a question that came up before. Um, Brianna, I'll just ask, uh, are there any other questions at this stage or just the pandan question from before? Yeah, we had a question about um steaming the rice, do you put it on high or medium high on the stove? So I've left it um, on medium high because this, this fire is pretty small. I'll just quickly show you. Um, you don't want a very high heat um, for this part of um, the dish because you just want it to be gentle. So that's the heat. That's a medium heat. It can go a lot higher, I think, but, it, but I've just left it at that. So um, you, there's also the option to um, steam the, the custard with the rice later on. Um, for that, you need to completely bring the heat down to a very low simmer. Uh, but for this part, because it's rice, we can kind of keep it at that sort of a heat. Gotcha. I think that was the only... Oh, wait. Yeah, she did say you can find pandan at Costco in the freezer, I believe. The freezer section. I mean, I, not, I don't know that from firsthand experience. <laughs> But I was told that that's like lemongrass and some of those other Asian herbs are usually frozen in the um, Costco section. Uh, sorry, um, in the frozen section of Costco. That's what I meant to say. Um, so we'll talk about pandan then if there are no other questions. There are so many different kinds. So as I mentioned at the start, you can definitely do um, a uh, frozen pandan leaf um, or dried. You'd have to rehydrate them with boiling water just to wake up the oils like I mentioned before. And similarly with fr uh, frozen, you want to wake up the oils with um, hot water and then you would just blend it. So I'm just going to actually uh, talk through, hopefully you can see this. 
This is pandan that I've actually blended and you can see that it's separated. So the top part is actually the pandan juice and the bottom part is the pandan um, extract or essence, if you like. And it looks like a green mossy sort of a grassy um, texture. It actually does smell like grass when you blend it, um, <laughs> oddly enough, but you don't want that juice at the top. So we need to actually skim it off. And you know the, the compulsive tendency is to go, I'm just gonna pour it out. But what, that, what happens when you do that is it starts to shake everything back up and it takes about 12 hours to have it separate like this. So this has been sitting for about 12 hours, which is why you're meant to make this a day or two before. So that's me with my little bent spoon that I, it's a little bakery, um, it's a trick that I found from a baker who, when you make chocolate cake and you need to pour vanilla milk, you, know, you can actually use it, you do it with a spoon. So same thing here, I'm just gonna do that and pour it in and keep doing that until it's ready to go. And ready to go would mean that most of that liquid at the top has come out because we don't want it for this dish. We don't want to throw it away. Uh, you, you can definitely use that to throw into rice to make pandan rice. You can, you know, if, you, if you've made a dish with lemongrass and ginger peels, you can throw that in and make a, an herbal tea. It's all very, very refreshing. It's a great summer drink. So you can always do that but I'm not gonna use this today. I just wanted to show that variation to you. Basically to make this, you would need about 20 pandan leaves with about hundred mils of water. And you can add as much water as you want, but you'll just end up having to throw, take out most of the juice and put it to the side because we only want the extract at the bottom. So it's a little bit of work to make that, which is why we have other options if you don't want to use those. So this is option number two two, I guess, because that would be option number one. Um, you can get, this is a pandan that's already green. It's very, very viscous, as you can tell as I move the bottle around. It's a very thick syrup. This one actually has sugar in it and it has vanilla in it as well. So that, you know, if you, if you end up using something like that, you just want to moderate the sugar levels on, on the palm sugar that you use, maybe down by 10 to 20 grams. Otherwise your dish will be too sweet, particularly if you don't like it to be that sweet. Um, the second option would be just a regular colored pandan, which is what I'm gonna to use today. Um, a teaspoon of either would be fine, uh, except that because this one's colorless, and we talked about how the blender liquid's brown, we're just gonna use some green dye. And we're aiming for a, what I call Kermit the Frog green. We don't want a Christmas green, because um, that's too green, although it's up to you. I've seen some you know, um, versions of this dish with translucent green. So it's really personal preference. I like the sort of olive Kermit the Frog sort of a green, and I'll show you how to get to that color with these guys. You can certainly get to that color with him as well. Um, and so that's sort of the crash course on pandan. Um, the only other thing I'll mention is if you do use fresh pandan, I would add just a smidge of vanilla essence. And, um, and the reason for that is because, I don't, I'm, I'm sure most of you would know this, but whenever you make a chocolate cake, the, the secret ingredient is to actually throw a pinch of coffee in. And the reason that is, is because coffee and chocolate actually share, share similar notes. And what the coffee ever so slightly does is it spotlights the chocolate even more and makes and highlights the chocolate. And so vanilla and, and, and pandan are the same in that way, in that if you just add a couple of drops of vanilla essence to fresh pandan, it's just gonna brighten up the vanilla. So if you use fresh pandan, just a couple of drops of this, but these guys usually already have some, out, some amount of um, vanilla in there just because they're chemically made pandan flavors. So hopefully that all makes sense. Um, I think we have a minute left before I need to pull the rice out. So up he comes and just gonna grab a towel. I'm gonna pull him out just so I can fluff the rice up. I don't wanna be doing it while it's in the pot just for safety reasons. I am going to keep that. That's gonna need a little bit of water added. So I'm just gonna do that really quick and keep it boiling for the last 10 minutes of the steam. Cover that up. I'm just gonna show you this pandan leaf compared to the fresh pandan leaf. Can you see the difference? So the fresh pandan leaves green and bright and vibrant. And this guy is a little wilted and, and, and kind of really dark. And so all that pandan flavor, you can't smell it, but it's just jumping into my nose right now. It, it basically perfumed that whole pot with the steam. So that rice now is nicely infused with this pandan leaf that's going to go into the compost bin. <laughs> and so we're just gonna fluff this rice up with a pair of chopsticks. Um, here we go. So 
what what um, what the oil is going to do, hopefully you can see this, is it's just going to make it very easy for me to do that because the rice isn't going to stick to the edges too much. It's just going to pull away quite nicely while I get a facial steam <laughs> because all the steam is jumping into my face. Um, it smells quite nice, actually. And um, we just want to move the rice around a little bit so that it doesn't become too familiar in the spot it's at, give it a chance to aerate, let, let some of that steam off and create some space for the butterfly pea extract, which I'm about to pour in. So again, you can definitely just use plain water um, if, you, if you'd rather that, or if you don't have butterfly pea extract, uh, or uh, you can go and get some. It's, um, it's like a green tea, like most teas are. It's very earthy and woody though. Um, and so that's, like I mentioned earlier, the thing that lends its flavor. So I'm just gonna randomly drop a couple of different spots of it, just to kind of give that marbled effect um, so that we have some white bits and some blue bits. And again, this is what makes it a very Nyonya style or Pranakan style of this dessert. And yeah, we're good to go. Hopefully you can see that, I think this, um, Hot is not hot anymore. Yes, there we go. So it's just white around some bits and blue around the other bits. And it's all swimming in there and ready to go back into the pot for another 10 minutes. And in we go. Just going to put the timer on behind me for another 10. What happens when you cook rice? Um, so as, as I mentioned at the start, when you soak the rice, it kind of partly cooks about 40% because of the water absorption. When you cook rice in a rice cooker and it's cooked all the way, um, it gets a really sticky sort of um, uh, finish and that's prevented when you simply steam it and then have an opportunity to fluff it like I just did. So if you can avoid a rice cooker, I would highly recommend it um, just because it's gonna have a very different texture. And, and, and the reason for that is we want just the right amount of starch so that we can press down the rice later on before we bake it. Um, if you've got too much starch, then it's going to become really sluggish, I guess is a word, if, if I could. Um, and, if, and if you cook it out um, in the rice cooker with too little water, it becomes too dry and then it starts to fall apart. So steaming kind of helps you make sure you, you sort of arrive at that balance that allows you to press the, the glutinous rice down. So, so as I mentioned, if you didn't want to use butterfly pea, you would use just plain water. And the reason for adding it at the 20 minute mark is just to kind of give that rice a chance to reorganize itself and to add that extra water for the final finish uh, for the cooking process. So with the coconut milk and water, as I mentioned at the start, we added coconut milk and water together to make the coconut milk less viscous so that it could cook. But for a final finish, we want to make sure we just throw some water in there and give it that last chance to come to a complete cook. So it's not just for the butterfly pea uh, uh, flour extract. Um, you would still need to pop the lid open at the 20 minute mark, fluff the rice and then throw some water in there. Um, so we don't have too long to go with the rice, which means we can get our bain-marie started. So traditionally, we do not need to use a bain-marie. For this dish, you can just use a pot and you can pour this custard in here and just cook it on a low fire. But I like foolproof approaches. And by that, I mean, you know, I, I like having opportunities to not get things burnt or overcooked. And the bain marie helps with that. So I've got some water in here uh, already. And I just need to make sure that my bowl is gonna sit on top of it. So much like the same way as making chocolate ganache, you want there to be space between the water in the pot and the bottom of the bowl. You don't want that water to touch the bowl because then it's gonna scorch the custard. So I'm gonna put the, the pot to the side for a second and just get our um, custard poured in. Now, as I mentioned at the start, I've left in the blender, but if you, if you didn't want that star anise to kind of get too friendly with the custard batter. You could have pulled it out earlier and I'm just gonna sieve it. And I'm gonna show you how all of that custard um, is gonna have um, a large amount of uh, star anise that gets caught in the sieve, along with any other lumps or any other um, bits and bobs that we don't want in a custard. And 
because we kind of want a smooth finish for the top of the kui. So I'm just going to use a little spoon to sieve. And pour the rest in. And you don't have to be too precious if you don't get all of it in. There's plenty to go around. Um, just going to put him over here and let that keep sieving all the way through. I just want to get all the way to the bottom so I can show you all the bits of star anise that are going to get caught. Quite a bit, actually. I'm just going to switch camera so you can see that from the side. But you can probably see all the, that, all that dark stuff is the star anise that we blended in before. And everything else should have come out quite nicely. So I'm just going to use this guy to transfer him. And you've got your custard milk ready to go. All right, so that's ready to go. And we're just going to switch camera so you can see me make the custard go from brown to green, which is always fun. So as I mentioned, I'm going to be using a combination of these two guys. So that's the pandan. So I just need a teaspoon of that to go in. And this stuff is really quite potent. Arguably, it probably is the fake stuff's actually quite authentic, if that makes sense, <laughs> um, which is often the case with vanilla. We're so used to the, um, the artificial flavor that we actually start to um, identify with it being the natural way things taste. Um, because when you add pandan uh, extract, you'll find that it doesn't go as green as if you would um, green dye. In fact, some recipes out there actually even say, whilst you use pandan, fresh pandan extract, you still add green dye to get that green finish. So I'm going to go in with half a teaspoon. I'm going to, I'm going to do a third of a teaspoon at a time because this stuff is really, really rich. If any of you have used dye, dyes for baking, you'd know. So that's a third of a teaspoon to start, just to see what kind of color it gets to. And then I can decide if I want to change it up from there. So, and this is where the, green, the brown just completely disappears, just because I'm using a green dye. And that's still relatively light. I mean, I don't mind that color, but just for fun, I'm going to flick the camera so you can see me um, switch it up from a light green to a dark green. So that's the color of it now. I'm just going to add a little bit more, um, probably half of a third, so a sixth really. And that's, that's the absolute amount I'm going to go at because uh, I like it to be a little bit more natural looking. So there we go. Very much Kermit the Frog <laughs> in terms of color. Um, or olive if you want to be a grown-up, which is not always fun. Uh, but yeah, so that bain marie is ready to go. We just need to wait for this guy to finish up. We have two minutes on the clock, and then we're going to switch things up and get this guy going. Now, while we wait for that to finish, I just want to talk about the bain marie for a little bit. So you could put a sugar thermometer in here and, and measure it so that it cooks up to 60 degrees Celsius or 140 degrees Fahrenheit. But because not everyone has a sugar thermometer, I'm not going to do that. I'm just going to show you how I do it, which is to kind of just cook it on a really low heat until it starts to coagulate just a little bit at the bottom. That's when you know it's done. And you don't have to worry about that coagulation because we're going to sieve it again. So like I said, foolproof way of of making foolproof way of making sure we don't actually um, kind of paint ourselves into a corner because I've tried this out a bunch of times. Um, I know all the pitfalls <laughs> and so I'm able to share that with you and so we'll do that together so you can see what I mean by coagulation at the bottom of the bowl and that way you don't need to go out and buy fancy stuff like a sugar thermometer or a, or a um, you know anything else really that like a steamer as well just kind of makeshift pot does the trick. So, yeah, um, I know even the shade of green um, is absolutely up to you or, or omitting it altogether. I mean, I've seen, and so this is a pandan version of it, which is again, the authentic version. I've seen versions of this, which uses ube. Ube is basically purple yam. So you could either use purple yam instead of um, too much flour, or you can use ube essence, and that makes it purple on top. I've seen versions of this where you put butterfly pea extract into this and make it blue on top and white at the bottom. So instead of putting the butterfly pea extract into the rice, you put it into 
the um, custard. So yeah, and I've even seen a vegan one where you add um, a type of pumpkin. So um, you, you can actually get pretty creative with it. Um, and if you, if you can follow, you can follow this recipe exactly the same if you just swap around the essence, um, but you'd be wanting to use an essence that is typically Asian because it's not gonna like, you know, you can't use chocolate essence because it's not gonna really go with glutinous rice, I don't think, <laughs> coconut glutinous rice. So it's something along the lines, ube is um, purple yam, like I said, or uh, pandan. Um, those would be the ones I played around with. And then again, color as well. You can always switch that up to whatever aesthetics you like. So now our rice is done and, and I'm gonna pull him out with my steamer thongs and set him to the side for a couple of minutes just to cool so we can get our Anne Marie going. And just gonna get rid of the pot from before, goes on, bring that to a boil and drop it down to very low heat once it comes to a boil before we put our bain marie on the top of it. And it's a little bit of patience with the bain marie. You can't just kind of go, I just wanna cut the cooking time in half and, and just bring the water to the, to the boil and try and do it in three minutes because it'll coagulate too quickly. And then you're gonna have a gluggy mess. So again, a little bit of patience and stirring. We'll wait for that to come to a boil and then we'll put that on. But I'm just gonna switch cameras for a minute to start to uh, show you what I'm gonna do with the rice. So this little towel is gonna come in handy later on for slicing, because we're gonna need a wet towel. So I'm gonna actually, because it's quite wet from all the steam, um, we're gonna keep him in a bowl. I'm gonna fold him and put him to the side and then wipe up all that steam and get the cake pan out. So, this guy is gonna need to flop into here and we're gonna have to press him down so that we get our bottom layer set and ready to go. So we're gonna do that um, with our little spatula from before. So this guy, I'm just gonna go around the edges of this bowl just to start to release it. It should come off pretty easily anyway, but just in case it doesn't, it's always good to kind of give it a nudge. And it is quite literally gonna flop <laughs> into it if all goes to plan. So let's find out together. So that's just gonna whoop, drop in there. And I'm just gonna get any of the itty bitty bits of rice that are left over out of the corners of the pan. And that's most of it. And as you can see, that rice is actually quite marbly. Look, so really, really marbly. And this is the bottom of the rice. So even though I poured the, the, blue, the blue water in, it kind of stayed marble even all the way down to the base, which is really cool. So we're just gonna flatten that now, but I'm gonna take care of the Bain Marie first because that's coming to a boil. So I'm gonna drop that heat way down to about yay amount, barely, barely on, um, and put this guy on top so that he can start coming up to a warm, not boil, but just a bit of a steam. And I'm gonna keep going with this guy. I'm gonna push him down because I'm going from a round to a square cake pan. So I just wanna make sure I get all the corners covered. There we go. All right, now options. You can get a spoon and just kind of use a spoon to mush it all the way down. That's option number one. Option number two, if you have a fondant press, you can definitely just kind of squish it down like so. And just get it relatively flat. Option, and this is my favorite option, um, is to basically get the base of a cake pan of the same size. And we're looking at something like this. And some baking paper, just to line it like that. And then you can just press it down. I'm just gonna grab one that goes the other way as well. 
like that. And before the steam curls it all the way up, just use that to press it down. And that way you get a relatively even um, press. And in addition to that, so that I don't have to keep doing that for about 10 minutes, I'm just gonna get a mortar and pestle and have gravity do the work for me and just push that down and leave that to sit in the side for a couple minutes while we bring this guy up to a, a cook. So let's um, do this together. Uh, I'm gonna get a spoon out and just show you at the moment that hopefully you can see that it's thick, but not as thick as we'd like it to be. Yet. It's still a bit runny. And uh, what we wanna do is bring it to that boil really slowly and, well not boil, but bring it up in terms of temperature so that it starts to thicken a little bit. And it's really important we do this because if you don't, if you undercook this and put it into the oven, um, it's gonna take a lot longer to cook and can potentially be a little bit messy. Like it may not come out completely cooked, it might come out mushy if you don't bring this to the right um, temperature. So th then that's the importance of, of doing it, whether in a bain-marie or a pot, my preference is bain-marie. But yeah, so there's a lot of patience, like I said, required. We just kind of got to sit and look at our Kermit the color, Kermit the frog <laughs> custard and stir, stir, stir until it's ready. And what's going to happen, which I'll show you when it does, is we're going to start to see some little bits of clump form at the bottom of the bowl that this spoon's going to pick up. And that's when, we, that's when we'll know it's done. And that's when we'll be ready to sieve it and put it back into the pan of rice that we just started up over there. So yeah, so just a little bit of patience. So um, I'm gonna keep stirring um, while we have a bit of a chat, hopefully. <laughs> and maybe this is taking a little bit longer. So just for fun, we can actually do that little experiment that I was talking about with regards to the tea. Cause I do have someone standby just in case things got a little um, longer. So I'm just gonna put him here. I'm just gonna grab some glasses. So I'm going to put one as a sample and one as a tester with lemon juice so you can see the difference. And I'm not going to forget about my custard because I don't want it to get too thick. So that's the regular kind. So even that color is pretty, pretty sort of rich and vibrant. Um, and here's another sample for us. So what I'm going to do is grab just half a lemon. I'm not going to put terrible amount of lemon in. I'm going to put it into this glass and we should see the color change. So here we go. That was a little bit of a mess. I think it needs a little bit more lemon actually. So let's do that together. All right, so to help us see it, I'm going to grab some ice from the freezer. Just if we have a bit of time on our hand, give my thing a little stir. Yep, that's now coagulated. So I'm just gonna lift the bowl off to let it cool. That bowl isn't hot by the way, cause it's not really, um, it's not coming to a very high boil. I'm just adding some ice in so you can see the color difference, hopefully. Hopefully you can see the color difference. One is magenta and, and that's the one with lemon juice, the one that I'm shaking. And this guy is just butterfly peas. So it actually does become quite different in terms of the color. Um, and I prefer drinking this one, to be honest. <laughs> very cool. Mm. Oh, and it's quite nice. It's very lemony. Perfect for summer. There we go. That's a little side experiment, but go ahead. Angela, I think Angela's cooking along, which is great. 
Um, I hope it's going well. But she said her custard is sticking slightly to the edges of the bowl when stirring on the bain marie. Should she remove it or is her heat too high? That's right. And that's exactly why I just pulled off the custard from my side. So it's got a little bit of coagulating like, like that. And that means it's done. And so without using a sugar thermometer, um, that's the time to pull it off the heat. And you're gonna probably lose some of that um, custard, which is totally fine because the sieve will pull it all out and it goes immediately onto our um, um, uh, pan. So Angela, if you're, you're, doing, you're doing this along with me, so let's do this together. We've got this guy ready to go. We need to pull a sieve out and we need another bowl to pour it into. And then uh, preferably one with a, a spout so that we can slowly then pour that onto the rice. So another bowl to just sieve that out along with the sieve. Just gonna move these things to the side and then we can get that ready for us to do together. So I have my sieve from before, which I'm gonna use here and I just need a bowl. Let me get these glasses out of the way. <laughs> I'm using my sieve from before. It's still got the star anise in it because I want kind of that last hit of it before it goes into the oven. I'm just gonna pour this guy in really slowly and some of that coagulation will get caught in there, which is totally fine. And away that goes. And just gonna sieve that all the way through. So hopefully you're following me as I do this, Angela, but we kind of want to minimize the amount of bubbles we create. And so to do that, we kind of want to keep the sieve as close to the uh, surface of the sieved uh, liquid, because uh, that's gonna be something we need to be very careful of as we step through the next couple of steps. But let me know in case you have any more questions. I have quite a, quite a bit of um, coagulatedness because I got distracted with my tea. <laughs> um, I just totally find that's what the sieve is there for. So yeah, um, that's ready for me to add into the pan. So hopefully you can see that it's got a little bit of a snap because I'm going to pour it ever so gently. Um, but before I start doing that, I'm going to pull my rice cake pan out and show you guys a little sample of the rice as well. So we're gonna pull him. He's been sitting for a while with the mortar and pestle. I'm gonna put him aside. We're gonna lift up the label that was on top and put him aside. And now we can see it's relatively flat. We kind of still need to trim out the edges. And I'll pull up a little piece of rice just to show you the texture of it. So hopefully you can see that. Oops, let me switch cameras one time. Yeah, so hopefully you can see that rice. It's kind of cooked all the way. It's sticking together, but it's not like wet or mushy or anything like that. It's just like cooked rice, except that it's a lot thicker. Hopefully that is visible. I'm not too close to the camera lens. Yeah, um, so that's what it's like. It's gonna put him away and just kind of take care of the edges. Like I said, it's relatively flat, but uh, I just want to make sure it's completely flat all the way through. I'm going to use my round bit for the corners. And that should be ready to go. The only thing I'm going to do before I pour the custard on top is score it. And the reason I'm doing that is to make sure that the custard has something to cling on to. Now, really important, I'm gonna use no more than just the absolute tip of the knife, because if we cut too far in, then that's gonna create crevices for the uh, custard to go further into the rice cake, and we don't want that. So I'm gonna do one on a 90 degree, sort of 45 degree angle, and one on a 90 degree, and, and then I'll be done. So I'm just gonna kind of just ever so gently just pull some streaks across. And again, not too deep. And I'm not, I'm being a little bit sort of messy, but yeah, just kind of some random ones are good to do as well. And then I'm going to pour, I think I will do it in this camera so you can see it. I'm just gonna pour this guy. Now, bubbles I mentioned earlier are really tricky. Um, so to try and minimize that, I'm gonna go as close to the bottom of the pan or the top of the rice as I can and just really slowly pour the 
custard. You can see it, it doesn't just, it's not too runny, it's kind of um, thick. And it's just gonna slowly creep all through and rise up as I, again, very patiently um, and ever so slowly pour it in. And you can actually start to see, hopefully you can from the camera, just little bits and bobs of the star anise because I can actually smell it wafting up into my nose. Um, quite nice. But yeah, just a lot of patience to avoid the bubbles. So step number one for bubble evasion or avoiding <laughs> is pouring slowly. Um, from the time we're done with the bain marie the second i'm about to do once i'm done pouring is tapping the, the can uh, the cake tin i mean just to make sure any air pockets pop all the way up to the top before it goes into the oven um, and because we're baking it one of the benefits of baking it again making it foolproof is just not having too much of a concern about having a smooth top when you steam this which you can do you need to steam it on a really, really low heat because one of the main problems I had when I first started making this and I steamed it was I kept having air bubbles pop up and it was because the steam was too hot. So I'm just gonna lift that up and tap it. So that should, and then kind of just give it a minute for the bubbles to slowly jump back up. I'm gonna put that in the oven shortly, but I'm gonna get a cookie sheet just to put it on so I can carry it in a stable fashion. So just a cookie sheet with um, a non-stick, uh, a non-slip mat. Um, yeah, I think this is ready to go. This, this batch has very little bubbles, famous last words, because <laughs> the bubbles do come up in the oven. Um, but again, uh, because we're baking it, it's gonna brown quite a bit. And because it browns quite a bit, it's gonna actually add to the character of the top of the cake rather than be an annoying little spot. So there we have it. Um, and ready to go? Uh, yes, I have. Perfect. I'm gonna just pop mine in as well. And you can put it in for, um, well, we'll talk about time in a minute, but let's just get it in without spilling it first. <laughs> I'm just putting, um, so the cook time is usually about an hour, 55 minutes to an hour. But what I like to do is put 45 minutes on. So Angela, if you're doing this along with me, I recommend 45 minutes because most ovens don't cook evenly all around. And at the 45 minute mark, what I like to do is go in there and rotate it 180 degrees just to make sure it bakes evenly throughout. I mean, I have two ovens that sit next to each other and they both have their own temperaments. Like they all, they both bake differently. So you can never be too sure if some if a cake recipe says this degree, uh, this temperature for this duration, uh, you, you still need to keep an eye on it. So 45 minutes to start and then rotate it for another 15 minutes. And what we should see is that top layer, um, Angela, will just come up to a bit of a dome. And then when it does that, we know that the custard's fully cooked on the inside. But yeah, so that that's, so I baked one last night and I have that ready to go now. So I'm just going to switch up the camera's um, lens so that we can pardon me, so that we can take a look at that. I'm just gonna get rid of him. And Any questions? I've just got my chopping board. I've got my anti-slip to go underneath. And I've got yesterday's version of this. So what I've done, so that's, that's it fully baked. Um, it's not sitting in its original cake tin. That original cake tin's just gone back into the oven, so don't mind the spaces. But I was able to pull it up. So when, when, when you do it, Angela, you just need to tease out the corners, use a dough, dough scraper or spatula to just kind of loosen it up. What happens though is the corners of the, the quig actually uh, retract from the edges, so it becomes quite easy to lift it off. And then I just pull him and kind of with a little bit of nudging, take him out and put him to the side. Um, now, what I've done here with a serrated bread knife is I've just traced. So it looks like it's cut all the way through, but it's only traced at the top, no more than a couple of mill millimeters through. And that's just to give me a little bit of a guide for slicing it. Now, 
I talked before about the wet towel. Um, I'm gonna just grab a bowl and put that towel in here with some water because we're gonna need that for slicing. Um, slicing is a little bit tricky. Um, I've seen a lot of professionals do it online and they do it, when they do it, it looks very simple. And then when I did it, it wasn't so simple. So I've come up with a little bit of a solution for you guys to try out at home um, if and when you bake this. Um, so what we're gonna need, uh, we're gonna need a little bit of a paring knife to help us along at the bottom. Um, you would have needed the serrated knife to get you going. I'm not gonna do that uh, right now because I already have it sliced up. I am going to keep a dough scraper to be able to slice it through later on. And my secret ingredient for um, slicing, which is an inspiration of slicing cheesecakes, dental floss, <laughs> would you believe? So. Um, dental floss used exactly the way you would if you were going to slice, oh, sorry, not slice, but if you were going to floss your teeth. And the trick with it is, um, and I'm gonna just make sure we we'll fold it down so you can see the sides. The trick with it is the top part of it is soft and the bottom part of it is soft. And with a little bit of gentle conviction, halfway down and then we, and, and straight, and I'll show, show that to you in a second. And then the rest of it is a little bit of a flossing motion left and right to make sure we get all the way down. So we want to have the floss like, like you would normally, just the right length so that you can, the key is to actually keep the tension on the floss. If you don't keep the tension on the floss, you're not gonna get a straight cut. So here I go, wish me luck, um, in through the crevices. And I'm just gonna go straight down until I can't comfortably go straight down. And we'll see the floss disappear and we keep going and we should hopefully get to the bottom part and we just do that flossing motion and we should see that this starts to just fall to the side like that and that's what we need the paring knife for the problem with this is the green bit can smudge if you cut through from top to bottom and that's why you need the wet uh, wet knife to, on standby. But what I want to do is I just kind of want to get to the rice part and slowly start to peel away from the corners and just start to pull it to the side as I slice it. Just going to get rid of the floss. and a little more. And I'm, I keep, every time I pull out the knife, it's got a little bit of pandan custard on it and that's what I'm wiping off, just so you know, like that. And that last part. Should hopefully come out clean. And there you go. Perfectly cut. Um, so I got the floss all the way down the green bit and then I did some of the rice I think with the floss and then most of the rest of it with um, the knife. And so it's clean and it's come all the way through courtesy of dental floss. Um, I'm gonna show you how if you cut it with just a knife it's gonna smudge just so you understand the importance of doing it um, with the floss. <laughs> and it's, it's not, like it's totally borrowed, right? It's really, when you slice off cheese, you have to, or you slice a cheesecake, one of the ways they suggest you do it is with floss. You can get one of those wired um, cheese cutters with the handles, so you can certainly use that. You can even get, get a cake slicer, the ones that you kind of just go straight down with. Um, but because this one's a little bit delicate, it can get smudgy. So I'm gonna show you what smudgy looks like if I just went straight in. I'm totally eating this tonight because it's not going to look pretty, um, but it's still going to taste good. <laughs> and I'm just going to, oh wow. Surprisingly enough, this one didn't turn out too bad, but let me hold it up closer and I'll just show you how there's some smudging. Hopefully you can see it, but there's some smudging below the green that wouldn't have been there had I just done it with um, the floss that I did and the knife. But yeah, that's slicing. Um, so once you get to that point and you get the lengths done, then you can 
um, you have two options at that point. You can either go into little sort of squares um, or you can go into little diagonal diamond shapes. So um, I'll do this one with squares and that one with diamond shapes. Um, let me know if anyone wanted me to repeat any of that um, in case I had any questions. Um, happy to take them as well. I'm just looking for my dope. Oh, there it is. Um, so I'm just going to score. <laughs> Was that you, Brianna? Yeah, it looks good. It smells great. <laughs> so I'm just going to score at the top like I did before. And that's just, that's the extent of scoring, really. And you can totally measure this out, by the way. I'm just eyeballing it because um, I can't be bothered measuring it out. But you can get one of those um, food, um, uh, dough scrapers that have measurers. And the, when you cut it into squares like that, you can actually tip it to the side just to avoid the smudging. And you can just go down straight and you'll get a clean cut like that. And so this one's a corner piece. So it's always going to have a little bit of character on the side where it tips up and has a little bit of prettiness, I guess. <laughs> but that's your square piece. I'm just going to leave them there. And you can kind of keep going and just follow the crevices. So I might just do it this way so you can see that I'm following the crevices of the kui. And we are just going all the way in. And we are done with the square bits. There we go. Now let me get a pretty plate to put it on. Um, so we can have the square ones here. And that's five pieces ready to go. And we can do a diamond shape with this one. So I'm just going to score it. And so a diamond shape really just means on the 45 degree angle. So instead of kind of cutting it that way, you kind of just go across. I'm just gonna do that again so you can see it. Instead of going that way, you just kind of go this way. So you get a corner piece, just totally going into my um, snack pack for tonight. And then you kind of just keep doing that. So another 45 degree angle. And this reminds me of Indian desserts, things like um, Kalakan or Barfi usually take this shape, which I <laughs> actually quite, wouldn't mind having right now. Um, but yeah, so scored on the diagonal like that. And then same thing, take the dough scraper and you kind of just go through it and it should come out relatively clean like that. And you can see a um, couple of things just while I have this piece here. From baking it, you actually get a lot more texture and character. Um, that top layer is completely sort of um, caramelize, it's going to have a lot of rich, deep flavor as opposed to the rest of the custard. And then a lot of that air came through as well, um, which raised it up more so than it normally does, actually. Um, but yeah, that's, that's, um, that's what it's going to look like. I'm just going to finish slicing these. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to pull out a version of this that was steamed so you can see the difference in the texture. Here we go. So I'm just going to finish slicing. a quick wipe to make sure we have no smudging. And yeah, here we go. We've got lots of lovely um, pieces, except for this guy's bit stuck. So we're gonna, there we go. Bit of patience and a lot of love to slice these guys up to make sure they look pretty. And there we have it. I'm just gonna put these in here corner pieces and diamond pieces around the corner. So there you go. You can have the diamond pieces look a little bit different. They're a little bit more sort of, I guess, pretty in, in the sense in terms of the shape. What I'm going to quickly do, as I mentioned, is I've got some steamed ones that I did um, a couple days ago. So that's what they look like relative to the going to grab a square one just to show the difference. So a steamed one at the top is a smooth layer at the top and it's kind of very pretty. This is actually a corner piece as well and it's kind of just got that very custard left untouched. Um, the trick with it though is sometimes as you can see there's a little blemish there. It's, it's really hard to get perfect. Um, I think I did get this piece relatively perfect. See there you go. You can see what that looks like if you just steam it and if you steam it at a low heat. 
versus if you bake it. And that's the foolproof way, right? So if you bake it, you can kind of just get that caramelization at the top and that sort of broiling effect that kind of just makes it part of the character as opposed to it needing to be um, looking uh, anywhere near as perfect as this. And that's kind of the toss up. And, and I also believe that there's a little bit of flavor that comes from just having baked it because the custard actually goes quite um, dry on the top. So yeah, there you go. Um, that's the baked version that I'm gonna put back. And the only other thing I'll call out, Brianna, before I hand back to you, is if you if you think that it's too hard to make the custard, um, I'm just gonna show you on this side of the plate is just the rice. And it's actually a dessert on its own. It's called pulut takan or pulut tai tai, which is um, pressed rice. So it's the same, the same rice recipe we did. Um, I would just add two tablespoons of sugar to the rice just to give it some sweetness because on its own it's it's quite sort of it doesn't have any uh, sweetness whereas this this one has sweetness coming from the custard but yeah this guy on its own is again a nyonya dessert it's usually served at weddings with kaya so this is the kaya jam that i mentioned earlier and i've just done a rustic style where i've just smeared some on top you can definitely use an icing bag and get pretty um but yeah on its own totally legit it's a it's a it's a dessert if you don't want to go and do the whole nine yards and and, and do an Angela and do the custard, you can totally just do the rice. And it's actually pretty, it's pretty good when you have it with some, some top quality Kaya. Um, but yeah, there you go. I'm just gonna switch cameras back so you can see my face um, instead of talking to a plate. But yes, <laughs> there you have it. Well, I'm gonna have a slice right now, but yes, go ahead. <laughs>